So, if you have your Bibles tonight, off we go to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. I was stationed in the Philippines in the Navy. I did two years there, 85 to 87. And I attended a church outside uh, the base, so it was a local church. And every time they talked about this book, the pastor would say, Ah, oh, the book of the Philippines. Yes, it's going to be one of the heavenly language. We even have our own book. I said, Well, maybe, yes. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. And if you're able to, if we could stand for the reading of God's word, this is the first, the first reading. Philippians three thirteen. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, please be with us tonight as we open your word to a mighty work as only you can. All the glory to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. Okay. One life to give. One life. Let's see. You've heard of Alexander the Great. Yes. He, what did he do? He conquered the entire known world. Because it wasn't all known. But he conquered much of it by the time he was what? In his 30s. And he died at 33 years old. Mm. Overachiever. Yeah. <laughs> Mother Teresa. What'd she do? Well, she got a Nobel Peace Prize for her work among the poor in India. And at 87 years, she died. Nelson Mandela. Yes, he also won the Nobel Peace Prize for his work in humanitarian uh, human rights issues. And he died at 95. No one is really sure how old the, at least I'm not, I'm not sure how old the Apostle Paul was when he died. But we often remember him as, besides Jesus, the greatest missionary that ever lived. Now, what do all these people have in common? Besides being dead, of course, on this earth. What did they do? They were given one life on this earth, and they did something with that life. Now, we won't say all these are... Well, probably besides, except for Paul, I don't know if any others were, were saved, maybe not. But we were given a life by God. He gives us a certain amount of time, and we don't know how long that is, usually. But he's given us an amount of time to do what? To do something. And of course, the things we want to do as believers, yeah, we wanted to count for the things of Christ. Now, unbelievers, of course, they're, you know, they're going to make marks in history. They'll go down in history of doing this and that, but we can't, we can't say it's for Christ. You know, there, there are things that have helped us. We have these things called phones, these cellular phones. Okay, somebody came up with all that. You know, and that's a great invention. Well, it's a double-edged sword, I think, technology, <laughs> a blessing and a curse. But there's... But we're, my point is, we're given an amount of time to do something. So I'm going to address us as believers, not unbelievers, but as believers, we're given time to do something for Christ. Now, it doesn't mean we all say, okay, I'll go to the mission field and I'll burn myself, myself out for Christ and that's what I'll do. Eh, I mean, if you feel that's what you should do, absolutely. Absolutely. But it doesn't mean we're all called to go to the field. Absolutely not. And, uh, you know, most of us, including me, you know, we're not going to 
We won't go down in history as somebody well-known like some of these other people I mentioned. Probably not, but that's, that's not a big deal. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 1, and I'll show you why it's not a big deal. 1 Corinthians 1.26. 1 Corinthians 1.26. 1 Corinthians 1.26. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. We do not have to be well known to do something for the Lord. Amen? Amen? Yes. We're not going to go down in history as somebody famous or infamous, hopefully not, about... You know, in the world, God, besides the Apostle Paul, I mean, he could be the exception. I mean, he was well-educated, that's for sure. He was a Pharisee. You know, he was a Hebrew, a Hebrew of Hebrews. I mean, he had all those, all that prestige as a Pharisee. And yet the Lord, the Lord did not raise him up, actually. What did the Lord do? He brought Paul down to what? To become a slave for Christ. And most people that are doing something for the Lord are not famous people. You don't hear about too many, what would famous, I, don't, I hate to use actors or actresses, but you know, the celebrities, they're well known, but we don't hear of too many celebrities giving up their careers to go in, into ministry. There could be a few here and there, but I think most that do that, they keep one, they have one foot in Christ and one still in, their, in the world. And uh, we have to be careful of that because the world can pull us away from the work of Christ. And it's a much better testimony, in my opinion, is to be you know, full in in whatever you're going to do for the Lord. doesn't mean you can't work a secular job, of course, but whatever you're going to do for the Lord, then just make sure you do it and not... And not stay tied to whatever we were doing before. But, uh, but it's a great thing. The Lord does not require us to be highly educated or famous or rich or handsome or beautiful. He just requires what? He wants people willing to say yes. That's going to be the point. Willing to say yes or here am I, Lord. Use me. Uh, when Elaine and I got to Temple Baptist Church, our sending church, in, in, back then it was Herndon, Virginia. So we first came here on deputation in 2014. That was the first time we came here to present our ministry. Pastor Arp was here. And it was, I think, May. It was either May or early June we were here. And uh, so... And that's when you all took us on for support, and that's when it began. And, uh, but when Elena and I got to our, our home, our sending church, we were coming from, where we came, we came from Chicago. I did a one-year residency in orthopedics in Chicago, uh, suburban Chicago, and we arrived at Temple. And at that time, I had no aspiration, no no desire, not even thinking about going to the mission field. I told Elena, you know, this is a good church. They've got a Christian school, a good stable school. And uh, I think this is where we should be. And that's where we, we, uh, we stayed. We had three, we have three children. Quick update. So Sean is the firstborn. Eric, he's a little taller than Sean. And then Rachel. So we have two boys and a girl. Uh, so Sean is 33. He's a physician. He works in family medicine. And he's going to take his first job in Iowa. <laughs> Why Iowa? That's going to be a long drive. Uh, all our churches are east, pretty much. So I know as, as a family physician, he wants to do everything. He wants to deliver babies and then take care of grandma, who's 99 years old. He wants and everything in between. That's I mean, that's what they call full-spectrum family practice. And I guess he couldn't quite find that, at least the right job in the East. So actually next week, or this coming Monday, he's packing up the truck, and, and off he goes to 
little Lamar's, Iowa. It's near Sioux City. And uh, so he's doing our second son, uh, uh, Eric. He's the only one who's not in medicine or nursing. I don't know what I did wrong. <laughs> oh, I just don't know where I went wrong. But So he works in computer science. He's a programmer. Just sits in front of big screens and just types. And I don't know what he does. That's, but, but he's the one that gave us the grandchild. So he is redeemed in my eyes. Yes. So that's okay. Computer stuff. Yeah. And he's in Yonkers, New York. Ugh. But that's only because his wife is from there. That's where she grew up, in New York City. So, but they assured me they will move someday when the, the child is, is school age. But we'll see. And then there's Rachel, our youngest. She's a nurse. She works in an orthopedic surgery center. She's in Leesburg, Virginia. And uh, married. So two men. Sean. Yeah, Sean's not married. The physician is not married. So any single ladies, if you want to... Give me your number, and I'll forward it to him. Just kidding. Okay. So, where was I? Oh, yeah, our children. Temple. We were there. I told Elena, all right, let's roll up our sleeves. We're going to serve here, and, you know, we'll just see what the Lord has for us. And that's really all he's asking. You're here at Emmanuel. Hopefully your sleeves are rolled up, and most, probably most, you know, on a Saturday night. Yes, we got the the... the the sleeve rollers here tonight. That's good. And uh, maybe not everyone is, but what? I'm just saying the sleeves thing, a heart that's willing to serve. And uh, so we did. We served in Awana. Oh, we did Awana Cubbies for uh, 10 years or something. Oh, boy. Those little ones, are they can memorize a lot of scripture, those children, I'll tell you. And, uh, and I wanted to do something, and I said, Pastor, what, you know, when we first arrived, what, what can I do? I'm ready. I went maybe, you know, teach Joshua Club. That was a, like a men's Bible study. He said, okay, Brother Allen, here, this is what we need. We need somebody to make coffee. <laughs> what? Make coffee, really? Now, this is because mainly we live very close to the church, just a couple miles away. So I got up every Sunday morning, 6 o'clock. I first, I go to Dunkin' Donuts, and I get the little donuts, and I bring them in. And I fill up five or six urns of hot water and the coffee and turn them on and go back to the house and change and come back. Now, why do pastors do that? You know, for, especially when someone's new. I mean, we joined the church, we were members, but he's, you know, a pastor is usually not going to take someone who just arrived at the church and make them assistant pastor or even a Sunday school class or anything with... Where, you know, with responsibility. Why? Because the pastor wants to see what that person is all about. Are they faithful in doing a little job? Are they going to do it correctly? Is there some, at least some attention to detail in getting it done? And that's the way pastors evaluate people. And uh, another missionary colleague of mine, he's in Mexico, and he said the same thing. He's from California. And his home church, when he first went there, his job was cleaning the bathroom. I was thinking, Whew. Yeah, at least I didn't get that job, man. At least I got coffee. I can take some of the coffee myself. But uh, so, so what? My point is, we get to a place and we just do what the pastor wants us to do. It doesn't mean it's going to be a prestigious or you know, well sought after position could be something very simple, but it should be something done with what? A servant's heart. You know, there's, I'm sure, a lot of hymns about that. Give me, Lord, a servant's heart. Isn't that, is that Ron Hamilton? Or something. I think it was. So, a servant's heart. A servant heart will clean the bathroom, he'll make the coffee, he'll teach the Sunday school class, he'll run the AV system. He'll do what he has to do. Because remember, he's not serving really the pastor and the church, though he is. Ultimately, he's what? Serving the Lord. And in 1 Corinthians one twenty six, the calling of the brethren, you know, you know he, he's not look, the Lord is not looking for the wise, the educated, the famous, the powerful. He's looking for ones willing to do the job. And those are usually going to be the humble people. 
And it takes a humble heart to, to clean those toilets and get them all sparkling clean. And the coffee every single day for... How long we do that? I guess the whole time. From 99 to 2011. Whew, we never took a vacation because I had to make the coffee. It was terrible. Oh. But... The Lord is looking for servants, someone who's willing to do that. So that's what we did. So that was 1999 when we joined Temple. We had our children in school. Um, you know, they were in kindergarten, second and third were, were, were our children. And that's where we stayed. So how did we get to the mission field? Well, Pastor Pittman, David Pittman is his name. He's been there for 30 years now, a long time. He goes on missions trips. He's extremely missions-minded. I think he serves on the board at BIMI. You know, they have that rotating thing that they do a few years, then they come off. And he's all about missions. So one day, he even invited me to go on the next missions trip. So that was around 2000 or 2001. Off to Bolivia we went. And the pastor's really big into construction. He builds his own houses. Seems like he can build anything, but he'll whatever the whatever the missionary needs, he will do. So we had this building project, and I don't really know much about building, but I guess I was the medical guy. So if somebody cut their finger off or did something, I guess I had to glue it back on or do something. So, but the Lord used those trips to open my eyes to see that well, there are other things in life besides orthopedic surgery. Or, you know, whatever it might be done. We usually had about uh, 10 to 15 guys went on those trips. And we would, again, just do what the missionary needed to do. Our pastor made sure the missionary did not spend one penny for anything. So we'd buy all the supplies, any tools. We'd carry our own tools. But all the food, our pastor made sure that was all paid for. We didn't want to be a burden to the missionary. But... So the Lord, that's when the Lord worked on my heart about missions because I just, it was something that just was not in my mind whatsoever when we arrived at Temple. And, uh, and, we, and we see, we see who the Lord uses. But before that, you know, whether we're exposed to missions or not or whatever ministry in the church, we have to come with a willing and surrendered heart. You know, we can... We can be in church, we can hear about these ministries, but if we're not willing to open up and say, yes, Lord, here I am, then does the Lord use us? We'll see. It's not in my notes, but let's go to Acts, the book of Acts. Ah, if I can remember where it is, Acts. Antioch, where is that? That's, is that 13 or 9 or somewhere in there? A real missionary would know where it is. Yeah. Uh-oh. That was 13. Let me see. Hmm. Ha, 13. See, I knew that. Whew. Acts 13. Because there's Paul. And he arrived at Temple Baptist. Well, it wasn't called Temple Baptist. Acts 13, 1. Now... There were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manion which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul who we know as Paul. And what were they doing? Verse 2, And as they ministered to the Lord... They were working. They were doing things in that local church. And fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. My point. The Lord is going to use people who are already busy in the church. You know, pastors will probably know this better than me, but and I've spoken to some just to, to make sure I was somewhat correct. Usually someone who's busy in the church, who even if he's not maybe thinking of missions, that's the Lord. You know, those are the people the Lord are going to work on about possibly going themselves. And, uh, and that happened to us. I mean, I was 
I'm not bragging, I'm just saying. We just there I told my wife when we first got there, this is a good church, they have a good school, this is very missions it's a missions minded church. And I think this is where we need to serve and and we did. And uh, Elena did some other things with the ladies, and then we did Awana, and of course the coffee, the most important. Because that's what guys would tell me. Oh, it's a ministry, brother. I'd say, eh, this is not really a ministry. You just want coffee and donuts. And I think you've had too many donuts there, buddy. Let's uh, watch that waistline of yours. What's your blood sugar? Uh-huh, yeah. Maybe I'll check that next time, yeah. So, a ministry of whatever. We're what? We're there to serve. Paul was doing what? Paul, Barnabas, and these others, they were at that church at Antioch, just ministering to the people there at the church. And that's where the Lord takes those hearts, the ones who are working, hopefully surrendered. He comes along and he begins to knock. And that's exactly what happened to me. I don't want to take too much of what I'm going to say tomorrow, but... Uh, you know, because it wasn't just that. There's, my testimony is a bit longer than that, about how I went, my salvation testimony. Because I grew up in a home, just to whet your appetite, I grew up in a home with, we had nothing. No faith, no church, no religion, nothing. I was just a blank slate as far as religion or Christianity. Nothing. I didn't know anything. We sang the songs. You know, hark the herald angels saying glory to the newborn king at Christmas. But they were just words. I didn't, you know, the newborn king, okay, I guess he was born. That's why we have Christmas. But the words really didn't mean anything to me. And, uh, and how the Lord took me from that, that situation to hearing the gospel, to salvation, to the mission field. Uh, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Yes, yes. So... All right, only five more pages. All right, I'll be done soon. Whew. Okay, so the people, the Lord uses people who are ministering, who are working in the church. And it's the same thing in Uganda, because I see it as, you know, most missionaries are what? We're basically pastors on the foreign field. So in a Temple Baptist Church, the new building, regular attendance on a Sunday morning, Anywhere from 65 to 90 people in the morning. And how many are members? Are actually members, you know, on paper? About 20. <laughs> 20 men. You know, who said, yes, we com we're committed here. We want to work here. This is our church. Everyone else is just a Sunday person. You know, reg reg well, sometimes regular. I don't want to say always there. But that's the way it is in Uganda. And I'm sure it is many countries and even here in the U.S., that's just the way it is. But the church is going to be most effective when we get members who are committed to doing the work in the house of the Lord, which is mainly, really, mainly our work is what? To get, the pastor already mentioned it, to get the gospel out to your community. And of course, ultimately around the world. And that call, and that you don't need a call for that, I'm telling you, because the call already went out over 2,000 years ago. It's in Matthew and Mark. I like to use Mark just because it's shorter. Go ye there, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's the call. So you can't say, well, I'll wait until the Lord calls me. Uh, not that call. The call just to speak to your friends, your neighbors, co-workers, family, whoever. That call's already been out. And, uh, you know, so I do believe in individual calls. You know, the Lord, we, we see that in the scriptures, and I, and I felt that upon my life, but we have to understand that we need to be open and willing to be used. And again, it doesn't mean everyone is called to the field, because if, if you all left, there'd be nobody here. <laughs> For what? Yeah, you know, prayers and support of missionaries. And uh, so not everyone is called to go. I, I understand that. That's, that's clear. But we just have to have that heart to want to serve. And in Uganda, the people, a little bit about Uganda, people are very friendly, very open. The national language is English. Yes, we thank the Lord for that. I got a couple amens. Good, excellent. Yes. Seriously, 
that makes our lives so much easier. Doesn't mean we don't need to learn. We did study. There's two dialects in Soroti. Uh, Ateso, that's the dominant one. It's a much bigger tribe because each tribe has their own dialect. And then Kumam, K-U-M-A-M, that's the smaller tribe. That's the one we learned. Apoyo wu de 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 inin Yesu Cristo. Greetings to all of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is Kumam. It's fairly easy. It wasn't difficult. And, uh, but the national language is English, so that makes it, it makes it much easier. In the, in the bigger towns and cities, English is wide spoken. Education, it's all English. But you get out into the villages. When I say village, you'll see it tomorrow. They're just you know, mud huts with a thatched roof. And there's usually four or five huts, one for sleeping, one for cooking, one for storage. Uh, the, the latrine or bathroom is just, what do you call that? It's the, you know, the reeds, kind of like bamboo, and they just kind of make a half circle, and that's where you bathe, so you get a little bit of coverage, but uh, very, very simple life. That's where English starts to disappear, and we have to take translators, usually, to go out there if we evangelize. But very warm, caring people, very happy, though they're very poor. A lot of poverty in Uganda, but always smiling, happy, laughing. We'll give you, we'll share anything. Again, as I said, except information. It's completely the opposite of the West. West, yeah, we share lots of information, but uh, you want to borrow my car? Uh, no. You want my clothes? Uh, not these clothes, no, sorry. Uganda is the opposite. They'll share anything. That's just, that's just African culture. And uh, so, so ministering to the people of Uganda is a blessing. But my point is, because I'm talking about church membership, is commitment. Commitment. And you, you can ask any pastor just about any church. He's always wanting people committed to serving. Doesn't mean you have to teach Sunday school or be the assistant pastor. He just wants people committed to serve. So when we have almost 100 people in church at, at the, in Uganda, but we only have 20 members, and I, and I go, and about every six months, I sort of have, I, I preach a sermon on church membership where I'll go through scriptures related to why we should be members of a church, of a local church. And, um, but, I'll tell you, it's just like, it's, you know, taking, squeezing a stone and trying to get water out of it. They just don't want to commit for whatever reason. So it's, you know, it doesn't mean the non-members don't do anything. They help, but commitment. Again, why? Because what's the point of the message? We have one life to live and one life to give. Why not give it to the Lord? Sometimes I think, and even Ugandans, when we first got there in 2011, they had the simple push button, what they called candy bar phones. Now, oh, now they want smartphones. So they, sometimes they wear bare feet. Their clothes aren't so nice, but they all have that phone. They're walking down the road looking at their phone. and So technology, that's why I said a blessing and a curse. They get stuck with that and... Uh, so that's, that's Uganda. Uh, but commitment, if we just understand the lives, the sacrifices that people have made, whether believers or not, because someday, and then I'm going to close here, someday we're going to stand before the Lord. I'm talking about the judgment seat of Christ. And I have a feeling, I can't guarantee it, but I have a feeling when we all get there, whether we've accomplished a lot or not, we're all going to say, when we see him, we're going to say, ah, oh, I could have done more. I could have done more. Why didn't I? Why did I get mixed up in this hobby or this pastime that just took up so much of my time? How come I... But, but then it's too late. Once we're at the judgment seat, too late. Can't do any more works there. And, uh, but something to think about. Again, Alexander the Great. Mother Teresa, Nelson Mandela, yeah, they they made some great, great accomplishments. But you know whether they were saved or not, probably not. But that's uh, we'll let the Lord judge that. We are here today, November, sorry, November twelfth, 
or 11th or 10th. My watch is off, so it's on Uganda time. So here we are in November, early November, <laughs> whatever it is. What are we doing for him? I'm just challenging you, you to maybe reevaluate what you're doing or what you have been doing or what you have not been doing for him. Because I know we all want to hear, and we hear it all the time, we want, we want to hear, well, da well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well, that, that'd be a great blessing, but to hear those words, we have to be doing something that's well done. Now, I know all our work can, can be burned up, and we still have salvation, and we <laughs> thank the Lord for that. Because I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of burning, especially with me, some things. You know, you know if I have to force people to come to church, because in Uganda, not here of course, but in Uganda, people you know, fall asleep, they're playing with their phone, they're looking at their watch, oh, when is that pastor going to be finished? He talks too much. Okay. If you have to be forced to go to church... Because that's what they'll say if I accuse them. Oh, but I am here. You know, your body's here, but your mind is somewhere else. We've got to be careful. Yeah. I tell them, you're not, you, you're not going to get any re a reward if you're forced or if you're here against your will, you know, because your wife told you to come or whatever it might be. We want to make sure we serve the Lord with proper motives, faithful motives, and be committed. Because we only have one life. Let's live it to the fullest, give what we can give, and we'll let the Lord take care of the judgment after that.